Young. I'm the transition lead pastor here at Peninsula Covenant Church. And I love being here. It's been good duty for me. I will say, though, about two and a half weeks ago when I went to the men's uh, event called He Grills, uh, someone came up to me and said, wow, you are really making it hard for the next lead pastor. And I looked at him, and I go, well, what, do you, what does that mean? And uh, he said, well, you're preaching awfully well. And I go, great, I'm glad you appreciate it. I guess it's time to start preaching the crummiest, lousiest <laughs> sermons uh, I can do. So uh, beginning this morning, <laughs> I can't do that. Can't do that. This morning, our text comes from the Gospel of John. We are looking at what does it mean to be the church of Jesus Christ. We are looking at the fact that we are a healing community. Now listen to what the disciple John said. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, with, uh, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, in which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. And the first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the, inv the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath! The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together not only be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, but may they challenge us in those places where we need challenging or comfort in those places where we need comforting. And Lord, I, I pray that you will hide me behind you because it is you whom they have come to hear. Touch their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the people of God said, in every story, it's not just words. There's emotion. There is context. There's a mental frame of mind. There's attitude. And there's no difference in this case. 
What was going through this man's heart at that moment when Jesus came alongside and said, do you want to be well? He might have felt something like this. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Sing it with me. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. 38 years I was lying there. By the side of a healing stream. 38 years is a long, long time. When life has dashed your dreams. I watched them come and I watched them go. Day after weary day. If this is life, then give me death. Please just take my life away. I've got no one to help me wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Stranger came to me one day. Would you like to walk again? Please don't raise those hopes once more. Cause I just can't stand the pain. Sure, I'd like to walk again. But I have no one at all to take me to the water's edge when the angel comes to call. I've got no one to help me wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. God's going to trouble the water. Jesus comes along with this man. He asks him, would you like to be healed? Well, would you like to be well? This man's been there for so long. He, um, he's developed a way of living. He has these tapes. He has these automatic responses. He doesn't even hear Jesus ask him the question. He goes, you know what? I've been here for 38 years. No one cares about me. All these other people are wanting to get into the water before me. hate this place. No one cares. And so, yeah, I would love to get in there, but you know what? Everyone's against me. The church is against me. My neighbors are against me. These people here are against me. And it's all because of climate change. <laughs> he mutters. We talked about muttering a few weeks ago. We are experts at muttering. And sometimes we live with our tapes. 
We live in the patterns we have developed over a long period of time. We end up not hearing the voice of Jesus. We don't hear him ask the question. Sometimes it's out of fear and anxiety. I can tell you uh, an example of when one day uh, I was so filled with anxiety, I didn't even hear the person speaking to me. I just moved to New Jersey. I would just taken my first call as a pastor. My wife and I went into New York City to explore it. We decided that we would go into Chinatown. We would go get some dim sum. And I want to tell you that I was freaked out because I thought, I'm going to walk into Chinatown. Everyone's going to look at me, and they're going to expect that I understand the language. I'm a rube from Colinga, California. (laughs) My parents talked, spoke Chinese, but they did it so that my sister and I couldn't understand them. I mean, I had no Chinese language skills. And so we found this little narrow dim sum place. We walk in, we sit down, and my heart's going like crazy. A waitress comes up, and she speaks to us, and immediately I stand up and I go, I don't speak the language! About that loud. Across the table from me, my wife is laughing at me because she said she asked you if you want tea or coffee in English. (laughs) That's what happens when you are full of anxiety. You don't even hear what's being said. This church is full of high anxiety. We've come through some white water together. We are missing important pieces. In July 2021, Gary left as the lead pastor. In August, September 2021, the director of the community center left. In October 2021, the executive pastor left. In March of 2022, the worship pastor left. In May 2022, we uh, lost our director of the preschool. That's a lot of missing pieces, and we have not replaced many of them, which has made the load on the existing staff quite heavy, but I'm proud of that staff because they have stepped up. And for some reason, y'all thought that it would be good to hire a transition lead pastor part-time to fix this thing. (laughs) Not going to happen. Do you want to be well, PCC? Do you individually want to be well? Interesting that Jesus did not say to the, or ask the lame man, do you want to be healed? He said, do you want to be well? Because God wants more than just our physical healing and well-being. God wants us to live into all that He wants us to experience in his presence and by his guidance. And it's much more than just our physical self. God said, pick up your mat and walk. What is he saying to all of you? What is your mat? How do you need to start walking? and living. I can't imagine what's going in that that man's heart and mind and soul as he's walking with his mat after 38 years. Later on, Jesus comes alongside and says, see, you are well again. Stop, uh, Stop sinning or something worse might be happening might happen to you. See, what God wants is that 
not only do I want you to be healed, but change your life. You're, you don't have to live as a lame man in the side of the pool of Bethesda. There's a great adventure out there if you will dare to follow Jesus anywhere, wherever he leads. So what is your mat? What are you relying on? And if Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk, are you going to keep continuing to do the things you are now? Or are you going to be open-handed and embrace whatever God gives you from that point forward? A week ago, yesterday, a man by the name of Demarcus Ware was inducted into the Football Hall of Fame. And in his induction speak, he said this. He recalled the incident when he was assaulted by a gun-wielding man in a parking lot during a trip home while attending Troy University. That moment, which he never shared with anyone publicly, changed his life. Without warning, I was knocked across the head with a gun. A knife dropped to the ground, ground and I picked it up. And when I looked up, all I could see was the potential shooter's eyes and a gun barrel pressed against my head. All I heard was my family say, don't kill him. There was an eerie silence after which I simply said, this isn't me. And I dropped the knife. And at that moment, I knew God gave me a second chance. And I had to do something with it. That was my turning point. When God touches your life, it is a turning point each and every time. And what are you going to leave behind? What are you going to do? Healing. We all need it. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's attitudinal. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's some broken relationship, so it's, it's relational. Maybe it's spiritual. Where do you need healing? But God gives certain people the gift of healing, which means through them, God heals people. Very few people here, if any, have the gift of healing. I know I don't. So what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to pray as an act of faith, to pray for healing for one another. About eight years ago, I was teaching for Fuller Theological Seminary. It was the winter quarter, and uh, I was about week eight or nine. And I get this email from a student saying, hi, I've signed up for your class in the spring. You need to know that last summer I had a terrible accident and hurt my back, back, and I've dropped out of school. I'm taking a course right now online at home, but your class will be the first class I will attend since that accident. You need to know that I'm going to be standing in the back of the uh, class. I'm going to bring a, a, a yoga mat because I need to stretch out my back periodically. I will be walking around in the back. I will not be sitting still. If that's a distraction... Please let me know, and I won't take your class. To which I responded, you need to know that I am the biggest distraction in class. Please come. So on the first day of that class, which was on pastoral theology, she's telling her story. And she says, I'm from Modesto, I go to this church, and I've been at Fuller Seminary for X number of years, and this is the program, I'm, I'm an MDiv student. And, um, and as she's talking, I'm thinking, why aren't you sharing what you shared with me? 
And in the middle of her introduction of herself, I thought, you know, this is a class on pastoral theology. We have an opportunity to actually practice pastoral theology. And so when she was done, I said, I said that. We have an opportunity here to practice pastoral theology. And I told them the story about our email exchange. And I said, before lunch, I want us to come forward. I want her to sit in here on, in a chair. I want us to come around her, lay hands on her, and we're going to pray for healing. Now, you need to know, I do not have the gift of healing. It's sort of like me and houses. I don't buy, uh, you know, fixer-uppers. I make fixer-uppers. <laughs> but we are going to do this as an act of faithfulness. And so right before lunch, we gathered around her, we laid hands on her. Only two students prayed, and that's fine, and I prayed, and then we dismissed to lunch. And right before the afternoon session, it's a six-hour class on Saturday, she came to me with tears in her eyes. She said, I want to thank you for what you did. It was so meaningful to me. I just spent the last hour curled up in a fetal position in the back of my van because I was in so much pain. I said, well, you're welcome. We did it as an act of faithfulness, and I'm glad you are grateful. Two weeks later, she comes back to me at the same time. She goes, I want to thank you for what you did two weeks ago. And I'm thinking, you've already thanked me. You don't need to thank me again. God is good and sovereign. He heard the first prayer. Two weeks later, she comes to me right before the afternoon session again, and she says, I want you to know that I haven't felt this good since my accident. Two weeks later, she comes to me. I've already excused her for the fifth class because she had meetings in Chicago, and she said, I think I'm healed. And for me, that was a magic moment. I don't get those opportunities very often. And to be a part of that was extraordinary. And that class have linked us together in a pretty close relationship ever since. She's gone, went on to get her degree, to be ordained, to become a pastor uh, on the staff of her church. She has since left and she has come alongside many pastors and many churches to be helpful to them. A few weeks ago, she preached at an ordination service. And she did something that I never would have thought of doing, which was to offer an invitation to people that if they are not following Jesus, to follow Jesus. I got a text on my way back here to preach uh, Sunday morning saying that the tech people in the back counted eight people who raised their hand to say they were going to follow Jesus. I've never been so proud of someone. And I'm thinking to myself, she didn't let her injury stop her. She has gone on to, do, to serve the kingdom and do extraordinary things. And I've never been more proud or felt more joy that I had a little bit to do with her life, that God allowed me to join him in that whole healing process. This morning, we are going to end our worship as usual. There will be people up front to pray for you, but this morning, I want to invite you that if there is something in your life, be it physical, mental, emotional, relational, or spiritual, for which you need 
healing, to come forward, to ask for those for prayer. Each of us has a vial of anointing oil. And we are going to anoint you with oil and we will pray for you. Scott's going to come up in a second to close our, our time together. I'm going to offer a benediction and then I'm going to invite those of you who want prayer to come forward and the rest of you to go and to live into what God has to offer you. Lord God, thank you for this time, for these people, for the opportunity to worship you, hopefully with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that our worship has been acceptable to you, and that it has put a smile on your face. Lord, I pray that for any person here whose heart might be beating a little bit more quickly, that they see that as a sign that you are welcoming them up to the front to ask for prayer of healing. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that we are a healing community. We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and that we live into that. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and the people of God said,